Hello everyone, I am Nathan P. Butler. This is my vlog, The Voice of Reason or Lack Thereof. This is a direct continuation of our last episode. Uh, one of the things that I did recently, because you know, there just wasn't time to record a lot of other stuff and it had been a while since we did a Q&A, was put up a quick video on YouTube to solicit questions saying, hey, if you want your questions answered in a Q&A, tell me now and we'll add them in for the next Q&A video, which turned out to be quite a few questions. So that video has become videos. And we are now on part two of that Q&A. So I'm just going to pick up where I left off in answering questions, and we'll just kind of go from there. We start with a question from Retro Universe, who says, Sorry, my last question upset you. I'm formerly Fantasy Flicks. Gotta be honest, I obviously don't hold a grudge because I don't remember what the question was. Um, but hopefully this will be more fun to answer. Sounds good. If you could cosplay as any character from the Star Wars franchise for whatever reason, Setting aside the cost and availability of costumes, who would you like to choose? Also, have you ever had an opportunity to quote a famous line from one or more of the films to anyone you've met in person? Hmm. I think from a cosplay standpoint, um, I want to do something that... I mean, I don't think I look like any Star Wars characters, except maybe the jackass with the death sticks, possibly. Um... So in that sense, I would say it wouldn't be me just, you know, throwing on a costume with my face showing. So it'd probably be some type of armored thing. Um, I really dig some of the armor of some of the more customized uh, clone troopers that we see within the films um, and that we see within the Clone Wars. But, uh, you know, it's just not really something I tend to think about all that much. I mean, I guess it would make sense now that we're going to have a baby named Cade um, that... Cade Skywalker would be a good one, but I really don't think I could pull off a good Cade Skywalker at all. Um, I'm much more uh, pasty Hux-like than um, badass Cade-like at all. So probably some type of trooper or someone, someone who is in some type of armor, or maybe um, you know, like an like an HK droid or something like that. If you really had expensive equipment to make some very cool armor with all the doodads on it, or a Mandalorian with all the different, you know, uh, working bits and pieces on it. Uh, maybe even something where there's spring-loaded shoes that make it seem like you're launching with a jetpack or something. Um, but probably something along those lines, something where I'm completely covered. Um, have I ever had the opportunity to quote a famous line or one from, uh, from the films to anyone I've met in person? Oh, I do it all the time to people I meet in person! You probably mean a famous person, though. Um, and... You know, I don't think I have come to think of it um, with the people that I've met. Actually, no, I take it back. There's one. There's one time uh, that I can remember that was basically a complete crash and burn. But it wasn't from a film. It was from the adaptation of the film. So I've got a chance to meet and talk to a lot of the Star Wars uh, authors at different times. Uh, sometimes in person, a lot of times through uh, email or so social media now. Uh, or interviewing them on podcasts and things like that. But... The first time we ever did an in-person interview at a Con Carolinas, it was me and then Rich Siegfried and Ron and Janine from what then was a podcast called Requiem of the Outcast. And podcasting was brand new. This is 2004. The concept of podcasting was relatively new. I was only in my second year, I guess, at that point, uh, or give or take. Uh, or actually, no, it was right after the second anniversary of my Chrono Radio. My first show got started. Um, so this is like June of 2004. And... We get Alan Dean Foster in a room for an interview, and he's like, what the f*** am I doing here? Who are these people? Why do they want to interview me? Why is it only audio? And why is this guy, because of the way that Rich was recording it, why is this guy recording it with a camcorder aimed at our knees just to get the audio? Why doesn't he put the lens cap on or, you know, whatever? It was kind of a weird scenario. And we're asking questions back and forth, and he's being relatively cordial, relatively, um, but there comes a point where I bust out what was the, at the time, the most well-known and oft-quoted line out of his A New Hope novelization, which is, what's a duck? And why do I keep, it seems like the reds keep like flaring in the background a little bit for some reason. I don't really know why, because the light doesn't seem like it's really changing. Very strange. Um, but yeah, uh, I ask, what's a duck? to Alan Dean Foster, and he looks at me like I just took a turd on his sandwich. He had no freaking idea 
what I was talking about, or the fact that that line out of his novelization of A New Hope had become sort of this cult line in Star Wars fandom at the time. He was clueless, and I looked like a dumbass. So there we go, probably the, the time that stands out to me the most. Is the light flickering? I mean, the light flickers often, but is the light flickering now? I don't know. It's kind of driving me insane, though. Whatever. Okay, next questions come from Luke Almendinger. Did I say that right? Almendinger? What is the... Actually, it says three questions here. Uh, what is the number one thing you want to see happen in Episode Nine? I want to see a satisfactory conclusion to that trilogy. I want it to be able to stand as a trilogy... Um, give us resolutions rather than just being a jumping off point for another trilogy or another film. Um, I want us to have some real closure. What should the next Star Wars animated series focus on? Um, I mean, some era in which we don't really have much storytelling yet. Hopefully, though, an original group of characters like Rebels did. Give us characters whose fates are unknown so that we can have some tension when we don't know what's going to happen to the characters next in the series. As opposed to it being like Clone Wars, where most of the fates were already known, so the peril never really felt real for most of them. It really does seem to me like the background keeps jumping in and out of focus. In case you didn't catch the beginning of the last episode, this set of Q&As is kind of an experiment with me using my normal audio setup, um, but a new camera setup. And the new camera has some new features, and one of them apparently is to constantly pulse the red or something in the background. I'm not exactly sure what the hell's going on with that. Um, but it seems like my skin tone keeps changing and the background keeps changing. Maybe it's just on my screen. Maybe when I edit this, I'll be like, oh, didn't affect anything. I just sound stupid. Or it could be that it's actually happening and you're able to see the same thing. So I don't know what the heck is going on with that. Maybe if I turn off autofocus. The third question, which trilogy do you think has the best overall design for ships, creatures, planets, etc.? I'm going to go with the original trilogy because it's kind of the foundation for the designs. If you look at a lot of what they did for the prequels and the sequel trilogy, they were derivative of the original trilogy, sort of where could it have come from or where could it go next. So in that sense, a lot of it is basically just uh, uh, iterations on the original trilogy designs. Our next question comes from Hearts and Ewoks, who asks... Do you think Disney, at any point in time, will ever release any of the Legends content on DVD slash Blu-ray, such as the Droids and Ewoks cartoons from the 80s, as well as the delightfully awful Ewok films? I've discovered it is extremely hard to get your hands on those particular titles, which were released around 2004, I think. P.S. Congrats on the baby. Thank you. Um, yes, in 2004, right alongside the release of the original trilogy, we also had uh, those Droids, Ewoks, and Ewok telemovies DVDs that came out. But of course... The Ewok and Droids cartoon ones were those sort of bastardized four episodes into a feature-length feature kind of thing, which sort of made sense for Droids, but makes no sense whatsoever for Ewoks, and none of the episodes are even in freaking order at all. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, I would hope so. I would think that this would probably be something that we wouldn't see on DVD or Blu-ray. Uh, I'm assuming the rights would go along with some of the other stuff going on right now with Fox, but we'll talk about that from a different question. Um, but it strikes me that with Disney about to launch this new paid streaming service, that they could do something like this and put out old content very easily digitally without having the production cost of DVD or Blu-ray to be able to put it back out there for people. Kind of like what's happening, like my comic, which is actually back here in the little frames. And who knows, maybe that's screwing with the focus. Um, but the comic that I did, that hasn't seen print under Marvel. Uh, they have the right to do all kinds of reprints of Dark Horse material now that they've got the license. Um, and it hasn't seen reprinting in physical form by Marvel yet. But you can go get the issue marked with the Legends banner, and now with Marvel up in the corner, on Comixology, the digital app. So there is this sort of sense that some of the older content is being put out there in a digital-only form as a means of making more profit without production cost for a physical item. So if there's going to be this big new Disney streaming service on which Star Wars is going to be a primary focus, I could see them bringing those back uh, and putting them up there at the time. And then the world will be able to enjoy the Ewok films, uh, enjoy droids for the most part, uh, 
and laugh at season one of Ewoks and cry and scratch their eyes out with season two of Ewoks. Season two of Ewoks has never gotten a home video release for a single episode in the U.S. ever. And there's a reason. It's awful. <sighs> but we still want to see it because we're completists, right? We want to have access to those episodes. And now that pops into my head. What was it that Barrett said on Republic Forces Radio Network when we were talking about Ewoks and how Latara changed so much for season two from being the, the googly-eyed girl who's in love with Tebow and Tebow doesn't realize it to in season two being the heartless little harpy that winds up constantly manipulating him because of his feelings for her into doing stupid stuff? Uh, wasn't it Barrett that said everybody loves a skank? on Republic Forces Radio Network. So, you know, when, when your biggest endorsement for season two of Ewoks is Everyone Loves a Skank, you know that season two had to be fantastic. Um, all right, similar question or a tight in question. Paul McAllister here asks two questions. Uh, first, with the Fox buyout, do you think Disney will release an original edition of A New Hope and or a box set with all the movies plus TV shows? Okay, so first thing, let's clarify this because I see this reported incorrectly frequently. Um, it's not that Disney is buying Fox. It's not that Disney is doing a full buyout of Fox. It's that Fox basically is this massive part of like News Corp. It's this massive business um, that has all these different things, Fox Sports, Fox News, and so on and so on. They got publications. Um, but within that Fox banner, there has been 20th Century Fox and 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment, which have been sort of the entertainment arm of Fox, the non-news, non-sports arm. And that is basically what Disney is trying to swoop in and buy. They want to buy all the entertainment assets from Fox, which essentially strips those away from Fox and moves them over to Disney while leaving the rest of Fox around. I think Fox is talking about calling themselves New Fox once that happens. Whatever, you're still the old Fox, you just don't have the entertainment stuff anymore. Um, not that you ever let sci-fi live correctly on television anyway, Fox. Firefly. Um, so with that happening, what that would do is that would move the distribution rights for the films that have been tied up with 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment and its predecessors like CBS Fox Video and that sort of thing, um, would sort of shift that into Disney's playground for Walt Disney Home Video and then they could actually release A New Hope, release the original trilogy and so on and so on. Um, they wouldn't have everything yet still because there is still some issues with um, Warner Brothers Home Entertainment and how they've got rights to things like the Clone Wars, uh, except for season six. So it wouldn't have everything Star Wars under one banner, but it'd be getting close or closer. Kind of like with Marvel, you know, it brings back in the X-Men and it brings back in, I guess, the Fantastic Four. Uh, so now all of a sudden Marvel's like, hey, Fantastic Four's coming back. We'll make comics for them now because we're going to promote our own company instead of somebody else's movies, you assholes. Um, so now... You got Star Wars kind of back under the same banner. Um, I could see them doing... I'm not sure I could see them doing an original edition yet as much as people want it. Because even though Disney would see that as a license to print money, I'm not sure that Lucasfilm would go for it. Because Kathleen Kennedy, who's in charge of Lucasfilm, has said repeatedly how they don't want to tinker with the films again. They want to leave them as they are. And tinkering with the films, in her mind, is sort of the technical side. Um, and she has used that to refer to going back and sort of undoing the changes made for the different editions since the original, because the original master supposedly doesn't exist anymore uh, and was gone after making uh, the special editions in 97. Um, so if you've got somebody whose mindset is, I'm loyal to George and his legacy, I'm going to do what he wanted, and these are the only versions that will be made available because that was his wishes, even though he has no say over it anymore and that person's in charge of Lucasfilm, you probably won't see the original edition while they are in power. Give it a decade or two, slowly but surely, we have different people in power at Lucasfilm who don't have a personal loyalty to Lucas himself. Maybe we see it, but I don't expect it anytime all that soon. I would hope so, but I doubt it. Um, as to a box set with all the movies plus the TV shows, that I don't see happening. I could see a box set of all of Rebels, I can see a box set of all the films, or of three different trilogies now, and maybe another box set of three anthology films once we have a third one beyond Solo and that sort of thing. But do I see them doing a giant box set with everything in it? No, because it'd be so expensive that it'd be difficult for the average consumer to purchase or to justify purchasing at the price it would have to require. Um, 
I think you're more likely to get like an all access Star Wars pass to the Disney streaming service or something than you would to get a box set of the movies and TV shows. Not to mention, again, the fact that the Clone Wars couldn't be included unless they strike a deal with Warner Brothers Home Video because they don't have the distribution rights, at least not the physical distribution rights, I think digital either, um, to Clone Wars at this point. Uh, neither the film nor the TV series other than season six, which is part of the Netflix agreement. And on a similar topic, Paul also asks, when is a saga on home video volume two set to be released? So it wouldn't be a volume two. It would be a second edition, right? So it wouldn't just be like an add on. What it would be is, and I'm working on it now, actually, is a revision of the original a saga on home video book. What you would have is um, tweaks and updates to certain sections as I decide to add a little bit more here and there. Um, not a lot of stuff being added into what already exists, but things like, for instance, uh, Laserdisc label images decided might as well start adding. A few more early little odds and ends things like um, showing a Finnish copy, not finished, but finished, like in Finland, copy of Revenge of the Sith in one of the sidebars and something like that. Um, I may do a new set of sidebars. I'm not sure how I want to handle it, but I feel like there's more technical explanation that's needed in some cases, like... Um, about aspect ratio and what it means and uh, resolution and what that means in cases and stuff like that. Um, magnetic media versus, you know, CD slash DVD, et cetera, et cetera, optical stuff. So I'm not sure if that'll get a separate little section, but what I've actually started doing is I've started taking pictures for it. I bought one of those Amazon light boxes for like a hundred bucks or whatever it is. And it's really good. It just folds out nice white surface and uh, nice evenly lit built-in lighting and started taking pictures for the book because I was convinced by the people on the Star Wars home video Facebook page I was convinced that you know if somebody's really interested enough to buy a book on this stuff they'd be willing to spend a few more bucks on it to get it in full color rather than grayscale which is what I had to do for the original version so for the second edition it's all gonna be in color but that means retaking every single picture because the lighting in the room they were taken in originally when they were meant to be grayscale is not very good. So I'm going to have to use that photo box and take new pictures. I've already added like 60 or 70 replacement pictures into just the first couple of chapters. Now that that's done, or being done, it looks beautiful. Which has caused me to say, hmm, it looks gorgeous and people really want to see a full color version. And there's going to be about a year and a half gap between the home video release of Solo and the home video release of Episode 9 because there's about a year and a half gap between the release of Solo in theaters and the release of Episode 9 in theaters. So my original plan was to wait until Episode 9 was out on home video, which would put it sometime in mid to late 2020. Now I'm thinking maybe I just do it after Solo is out, which would maybe put it in early to mid 2019. I really don't know. I haven't really decided. I kind of want to see how far the writing gets on new stuff uh, like Last Jedi and that sort of thing and the new pictures are looking before I make the final call on whether I put it out after Solo's on home video or after Episode 9 is on home video. Episode 9 makes more sense in terms of completing out that trilogy, but Star Wars films are just going to keep on going, so it's not like there's really ever going to be an end until they actually end the Star Wars home video releases at all. Um, so, you know, jury's kind of out on that at this point, um, but I am really liking the way that the new color edition is tending to look. Um, but we'll see. Who knows how much time I'll actually have to write once the baby is here. Probably not a whole hell of a lot. This here is that moment that I realized that for some reason it was recording in 720p instead of 1080p during that last segment, so my apologies if that's noticeable at all. Uh, next questions come from Brian Snook, I understand that Brian is a buddy of mine. Brian is a guy who has helped me understand the steelbook business a bit, uh, understand blue fans and that sort of thing. And Brian, Brian's got kind of a sarcastic sense of humor the way that I do. So these probably sound off to many, um, but I think it's perfectly appropriate. Um, so Brian asks, paper or plastic, boxes or briefs, soda or pop? So uh, paper or plastic? Uh, paper for writing on and from books. I, I don't really like plastic books or, or writing on plastic. But if you're talking about grocery bags, um, unfortunately, I'm a terrible steward of the planet. I'm actually more partial to plastic because usually I don't want to make multiple trips back and forth to the car 
So if at all possible, I'm going to put as many plastic bags on my arms as possible and just walk it into the house. So uh, plastic, apparently, although if I had good, strong cloth bags that I could just take with me, I'd probably use that, but I just haven't ever done so. Probably will by the time the baby is here so that, you know, we can be good examples to the baby and be like, yeah, yeah, we've always done this. Yeah, we've always, you know, been good for the environment. Sure. Um, let's see, boxers or briefs? Um, I think that falls under the probably too much information uh, type of thing. I definitely think that boxers shouldn't wear briefs um, because it just makes everything jiggle around just a little too much whenever you're watching a boxing match. Uh, definitely no briefs for boxers. Boxers should wear boxers or some type of shorts. Um, soda or pop? See, I'm in a weird position. I come from Evansville, Indiana originally, which means that for me, it's neither soda nor pop. No matter what it is, no matter what brand it is, it's Coke. What kind of Coke would you like? I'd like a Dr. Pepper. What kind of Coke would you like? I'd like a Diet Pepsi. Doesn't matter, it's still Coke, which you would think would be the case with the fact that I live now in the Atlanta area, which is dominated in many ways by Coca-Cola Corporation, but no. Down here, we call it something, or they call it something differently. For me, it shall always be Coke, no matter what it is. James Lawner asks, have you ever met any Star Wars actors before? Um, bit part people, um, like Anthony Forrest, who played a fixer, you know, and they move along, move along, trooper. Um, not really a lot of Star Wars um, screen talent, so to speak. Uh, I've met some of the voice actors, like uh, Ashley Eckstein, and quite a few of the writers uh, for the books and the comics, but I've never really sought out trying to get a chance to meet the uh, film actors. It's just not something that's been all that interesting to me because I don't collect their autographs. Like, I like autograph books and comics, but I've never really gotten into collecting uh, autographs from film stars unless I was able to get them in person, which would be a very small collection, um, because it's so easy to wind up uh, getting fake ones off of eBay and things like that. It just isn't my thing. Um, the one thing I've actually got up here um, is, I can take it down from the wall, not just point at the dang wall, um, but the one set I do have is this. This is um, the Clone Wars cast, almost the entire cast that was signed um, at a celebration, I believe it was, or one of the weekends at Disney, um, and then handed off to me by a friend. So that I've got, um, but even then it wasn't meeting them in person. And the fact that I just got that back on the wall on the first try blows my mind. I have a horrible time hanging up pictures and not having them turn out crooked. So score one for me today. Um, then we have a question from Senator Confer, who asks, As someone trying to get into timeline making, I've got a question. Sorry if this seems rude, but I'd like to know how you summarize the things in the timeline gold. That is the Star Wars timeline gold, the most comprehensive Star Wars chronology available anywhere over at StarWarsFanWars.com slash timeline, which will be ending this year. Uh, how do you decide what you should or should not include in summarizing episodes, movies, etc.? I have a hard time deciding what's too much when summarizing anything for English papers or timelines on other pieces of fictional media. Again, sorry if this is seemingly rude. Also about the length of the question. No problem with the length of the question, and I'm not sure where that would be seen as rude. I mean, it's an honest question. Um, my answer, I guess, would be there is no hard and fast rule. And a lot of times I probably summarize way longer than I probably should. Um, if you notice uh, on the Star Wars Timeline Gold, most of the summaries for the newer novels are much longer than the ones for the older novels because usually I was doing those one at a time where I had time to get into more detail versus trying to rush to get a new edition out and summarize a whole bunch of old novels at once, particularly uh, like for the Star Wars Timeline 6.0 back in 1999. So that being said, I would say that the trivial little details you don't need, but stuff that actually matters to the plot, yeah. Is, is what you would include. But that said, you could generalize. Like, um, you could be very specific about what happens with um, with Finn and Rose and BB-8 and DJ once they get aboard the Supremacy, or you could refer to it as they go aboard to try to knock out the little, you know, capacitor or whatever the hell it is to knock out the hyperspace tracking and manage um, to get noticed and caught. Okay. Um, either one is going to serve it well enough. It's just a question of whether you might reference it again somewhere. I tend to err on the side of extra long summaries, but that's just me. Um, and part of that also is that I do that mostly for novels and comics. 
knowing that there are a lot of people who read just the comics but not the novels or the other way around and then read the summaries on the timeline as their way of keeping up with that information. So they're a little more detailed than I might do otherwise. Vintage VHS Treasures asks, What's your take on the Star Wars Complete Saga Blu-ray set not porting over any extras from the 2004 DVD set and the prequel DVDs? Wait, it didn't? But I've seen that 12-disc DVD set that has all the bonus discs. Yes, if somebody's trying to sell you a complete saga on DVD, it's a bootleg. But that's a whole other um, episode here on the, the channel. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's one of two things, right? On the one hand, I'm like, if space was an issue, then I'm glad we got all new stuff because at least we still have the DVDs for the other stuff, and now we can get all new stuff. That's cool. Overall, we now have more bonus materials than we had before. On the other hand, you do have that issue that most Star Wars releases had. Not just Complete Saga versus DVD, but DVD looking back on VHS and so forth. Where a lot of times you won't have a special feature get carried over into a future media. Um, that's why actually I thought it was so cool when they put out that reissue, that double dip um, of The Force Awakens. So The Force Awakens 3D Collector's Edition. Yes, that probably should have been the edition they released first, but... When they did release it, it included everything that was on the original release from a few months before, along with the new stuff, so you didn't have to own both to be able to have all the bonus features. Um, that seems to be the direction that Disney is seeming to lean, so hopefully that will be a continuing theme. We will wind up seeing uh, if there is a later edition of a release or a reissue that actually adds new content, that it won't take any new content away. Um, but... I don't know. I, I mean, it just, it sucked because I would have wanted to see stuff like the trailers in high definition. Um, but that would have meant remastering and things like that are upscaling anyway. And at least I've still got the DVDs. And in that case, a Blu-ray player will play DVDs. So at least you have the same player. I think that's less of an issue than, for instance, having some bonus features like, um, oh gosh, uh, the little episode two connections thing, for instance, that was on um, the VHS copy of Attack of the Clones in the US. Um, that feature doesn't exist anywhere on subsequent releases. So now you're talking about having two different players to be able to watch it, a VHS player and a DVD slash Blu-ray slash Ultra HD whatever player. Um, I think there is a little bit of a difference when you go from incompatible media to ones that play on the same player, because at least in the latter case, you're able to still see everything. And man, I, to me, the colors are flickering. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm having a seizure or something, and I just don't know it. Either way, not too fond of whatever is happening with the new webcam here. If anybody has any idea what's happening, please let me know. Of course, if you're not seeing anything, let me know that, and I'll determine if I need some medication or something. Uh, Jedi Master Daniel 96 asks, what do you think George Lucas's outlines for the sequel trilogy were? And do you think the Legends continuity will continue as an alternate timeline alongside the new canon? Uh, so to answer the second one before the first one, it already is, right? The Legends timeline is continuing to grow, um, just not very much. It's growing with the Old Republic and the stories, like the short stories on the website being released to supplement the Old Republic, the MMO um, from... Bioware. Okay, I'm officially turning off the overhead light because the flickering is driving me insane. I want to know if it's from my overhead light or what, but it's driving me mad here. Um, okay, uh, the other question there, though, or I guess to the broader point of Legends continuity, do I expect them to add much to it beyond the Old Republic? No, um, not any time in the near future. Maybe not ever, because they're very much wrapped up in trying to build this new continuity and tie it into the new films. That's sort of the marketing venture that that is. So uh, I don't expect it anytime soon, if ever, at least beyond the Old Republic. Uh, what do I think George Lucas' outlines for the sequel trilogy were? I haven't seen any of the newer reporting on it. I haven't bothered to look at it. But I know that back when he hadn't denied a sequel trilogy, you know, back before the, oh, there was only ever supposed to be six bullshit that he pulled, um, back in the 80s, whenever he would talk about episodes 7, 8, and 9, and people like Mark Hamill would talk about 7, 8, and 9, um, it was all sort of talking about continuing the, the theme of uh, family, having Luke wind up being sort of the new Obi-Wan figure in terms of the older grizzled Jedi-type figure, 
and uh, the idea of as the child had someone from the child's generation had to save someone's soul, so to speak, or redeem them from the adult's generation. Now it would be the other way around, where you had an adult having to save uh, the wayward child, which in to some degree, you know, you kind of have that dynamic with Kylo Ren being the wayward child in this case. Jamal asks, are you more excited for the new Star Wars movies or the new TV shows? I was very let down by The Last Jedi, so I'd say TV. Um, I don't feel like we know enough at this point about the new TV shows that are in the works, so it's hard to get excited about that at all. Um, so for me, it's probably the films, because I like Last Jedi, so the idea that Ryan Johnson will be given other films... I think that'll turn out okay. Um, having the guys behind Game of Thrones doing some films, or at least that adaptation, right, because that started as books, um, that I think will turn out well. And I've actually found myself more excited for Solo now that we've got some trailers, particularly the story trailer recently, um, than I was before for that. So I'm looking forward to actually seeing that here in about a month. So movies for me more than TV, but mainly because we just don't know anything about the TV show. Our next question is from Never Acquiesce, who asks, this seems like something you've likely been asked before, but one, two, three, cheers for redundancy. When you just want to sit and watch the Lucas Saga films, which do you put on? Personally, I'm Blu-ray for the prequels and despecialized for the original trilogy, but given your massive amount of choices to pop in, I'm curious to know your preference. Um, I have answered this a few times before, and my answer's pretty much always been the same, which is the Blu-rays. Um, I prefer the better picture and sound quality uh, and I'm willing to put up with the things that drive me nuts about the Blu-ray cuts, like the weird rocks that appear in front of R2-D2 from one angle but disappear from the other angle um, in order to get that better picture and sound quality. Um, I don't tend to watch the despecialized editions much at all, um, so they don't usually even enter my mind when I want to just grab one and pop it in. I just grab one of the official releases off the shelves, pop in the Blu-ray, and watch. Rock Nerd asks, do you watch... Star V's The Forces of Evil or Star versus The Forces of Evil? I'm not sure what that is, so my answer would be no. So you might want to enlighten me on what that is, but that is not something that I have ever seen. Then as Senator Confer comes back and asks another question relating to the timeline. It says, uh, here's another question. Apologies if it takes up your time. How will you place the World Between Worlds section of that episode, talking about Rebels, in the timeline? Will you place it in line with the rest of the episode or in its own little section since it's technically outside of time and space? Um, I'll just put it, when I do the summary, I'll just put it with the rest of the episode because that's the way that it would read and make sense because that's when, you know, the characters are popping in and out of time uh, more than likely. I don't see it as needing its own little separate area because then for someone who is reading it, it wouldn't make sense to read it as a summary. And lastly, a set of questions from Addie Marvin, and then I'll wrap us up and I will try to hunt down what was making the flickering, because I haven't seen the flickering since I turned the light off. It almost has to be that overhead light, so maybe I just need to bring a lamp in here when I record. Uh, I don't know. Don't know. I mean, it doesn't look too bad now, but I can't always record when there's sunlight coming in. If it's a stormy day, I'm screwed! Uh, and, and that is not to be confused with uh, if the woman's name is Stormy, you're screwed, which is a whole political thing right now. Um, so, uh, three questions from Addie Marvin, uh, done as one, two, and then a separate post. So number one on the original post, what is your personal favorite Star Wars home video item in your collection? Hmm. I'm asked this a lot, and I feel like my answer constantly changes, because it just depends on what strikes me as interesting at the time. Um, I am particularly partial to the uh, one-click blue fan sets. They're pretty nice. Um, when looking backwards... I do like some of the little oddball releases, um, like the 1992 widescreen sets, the Letterbox Collector's Edition, which was the first time that I ever had them on VHS, which also was when I first had them in widescreen because I didn't have a Laserdisc player, didn't have those prior to that. Um, one of the things that stands out to me, and it's actually why it's on the shelf, is this. This is that uh, George Lucas AFI tribute box, basically... Um, when he was given the AFI Life Achievement Award, they had the big ceremony, and at the ceremony, some of the swag for some of the higher-end um, people attending the ceremony was that acrylic box that's basically the most recent DVD releases at the time, as of early 2005, of all of Lucas's uh, major films, or all of his films. So THX 1138's in there, um, American Graffiti, Indiana Jones, Star Wars, and so on. Um, and it's just cool to have because it's such a rare thing, and it's kind of a nice, quick breadth and scope look at Lucas's career. 
which is also part of why I'm partial to the uh, 75th anniversary set from 20th Century Fox, because it's a nice look at the breadth and scope of 20th Century Fox as a film company that happens to have a new hope in there as the representative for 1977. Granted, not in the 1977 cut of the film, that would have been asking too much. Number two, is each new Star Wars film being released in multiple forms, such as retailer exclusives, steelbooks and such, more fun or frustrating? Yes. Oh, he's, he's asking for me to pick one. Um, I think it depends. Um, I think that for, for instance, The Force Awakens, it was kind of fun to hunt down the different releases. For Rogue One, it was kind of fun to hunt down the different releases. My experience of going to hunt down the different releases of Last Jedi was not as fun, partly because of pre-orders that didn't look like they were going to be honored um, and things like that happening. Um, but that was more the technical side of getting them than it was about just the variety of items. It's certainly a lot more cost effective when they don't do all kinds of retailer incentives because then your limited pool of funds you could spend on multiple copies from different countries. Now I'm kind of trying to grab one from Japan, all the ones from the UK, the ones from the US, and that's quite a bit all kind of piling up. Thankfully, we've got people out there um, like Julian and Ricky who are helping me get my hands on those. Um, but from the standpoint of, of more fun, it really just, like I said, it really just kind of depends on the release. I think it's more fun to hunt down the weird stuff, though, than it is to get the new stuff. Um, like, it's fun to get all the new stuff and be like, okay, it's time. I can cover it, and I can cover it all and be a definitive resource for people. That's fun, and that's an enjoyable thing to do. But actually getting it all, kind of a pain, uh, especially when you've got, you know, companies like Disney Store sending out their exclusive lithographs with no padding whatsoever so everybody's are showing up damaged. That kind of shit just keeps it from being fun because you're more frustrated by the fact that the stuff you're getting isn't in good condition, and it's brand freaking new. Um, but that's, again, that's less a matter of the variety than just the process. And the last question um, from Addie Marvin is, do you have any need-to-know tips for those thinking about publishing a book through Amazon, which, of course, is how I did um, a saga on home video? I would say that there's probably two main things that I would say. Um, number one, is, or three, three. Number one, start with one of their templates. Don't even start writing outside the template because that way your formatting will actually work in theory. Um, two, always make sure that once you've uploaded your digital file of your book's contents that before you order a physical proof copy that you look at the digital proof. You would think that the digital proof will look exactly like the file you just submitted. It will not. There will be times where the pagination is different. Um, you may have to handle your footnotes differently. And that would have saved me some headaches and about a week of lead time in the book if I had just looked at the digital ones in more detail before ordering the first physical proof copy to come in. I learned that on subsequent proof files being sent in. Um, and then the third would be beware of pictures. If you want to include pictures, you're going to have to come up with a decent setup. Um in order to get all the pictures in that you want. Like if it's just one picture, and it's just sort of centered in line with the text, no big deal. But a song on home video was very image heavy. So to make sure the images could line up the way that I wanted them, especially for comparison images and whatnot, I used tables. And basically you use a table, insert the picture, have a separate line on the table for your um, caption. And then if you're gonna add more pictures, just a blank row and then Two more rows, picture and caption, that sort of thing. Um, and then just take out all of the lines, make it so the lines are invisible, which looks great on the printed page. It is a nightmare if you then try to convert that file from a physical book template into an ebook. That's why there's not an ebook version of a saga on home video, because it is a nightmare to then fix all of those images because the table formatting way of doing it doesn't work well, the least of your worries is that all the lines come back in that transformation process. Um, but there's a lot more issues with formatting that happen because of that. So if it's going to be image heavy, either one at a time in a very non-dynamic looking way and be able to put out an ebook or make them dynamic and lay them out how you want, but know that an ebook may not be possible, which was the case with the Saga on Home Video. Uh, all those over the technical side, 
of things, right? I mean, basically, the biggest parts of it are the writing itself, right? Uh, afterwards, it's just a matter of making sure that you have a sense of where the landmines are as you're trying to actually put it out for publication so you don't step on one and, you know, kind of explode and wind up adding a week or two to how long it's going to take to get your book ready. And with that, we've taken care of all of the questions asked uh, in that video that was published back uh, on April 18th, 2018. Thank you all for your questions. If you have questions for future episodes of Q&A, feel free to put them down below this video, uh, preferably this one, not the last one, but I'm sure people will put them on the last one too because they haven't seen this one yet. Um, and then I'll answer some more in the near future. If you want to have access to an exclusive monthly Q&A, where I'll definitely be answering any questions that come in on that one, the exclusive monthly Q&A is available for the nobility of the Butlerniverse. That is the $10 uh, and up tier of uh, supporters on Patreon, and I do do that every single month with a much smaller pool of people asking questions to allow a little more depth and a little less formal responses in the answers. As if I'm really all that formal in these answers anyway, right? Um, but uh, that is up there over at patreon.com slash Nathan P. Butler if you're interested in that. Uh, until next time, probably that will be the uh, review, the spoiler-free and spoiler-filled reviews of Solo more than likely about a month from now. Uh, until next time, may the force be with you. Thank you for your questions, and I'll see you soon.